hi, and uh, good afternoon to uh, to everybody. Um, welcome to uh, today's webinar from IPASS. Um, and today we're going to be talking about how IPASS is combating new security threats related to uh, Wi-Fi, specifically public Wi-Fi. Uh, my name is Neil Griffiths. I uh, head up product marketing here at IPASS. Um, and security is something that's kind of been uh, very near and dear to my heart over the past year or so, working with um, several large uh, OEM um, and uh, carrier partners within uh, within ipass um it's a very this is a very interesting topic and it can be a very interactive topic and people can have a, uh, many opinions on, uh, on 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 security and how best to uh, properly secure wi-fi networks if you have any questions or comments um there is a, a a questions box in in the interface that you can actually use to uh, to post questions as we go through uh, and i'll um, endeavor to answer them as we uh, as we uh, as we go through the webinar, so uh, let's get started. So let's talk about the uh, let's talk about the threats. Um, well, it's probably no surprise to anybody that mobile attacks and uh, vulnerabilities are increasing. Um, you know, as mobile workers become more mobile and are using more uh, uh, more of their own devices in more and more diverse places uh, to connect to to connect to Wi-Fi and, and, and access uh, enterprise assets. Um, Hackers are realizing this and are, and, are, and are looking to target these specific users. Um, actually, the Gartner, the Gartner, this Gartner study that I'm referencing here, the Gartner Predicts uh, study, is actually uh, is actually not a bad piece uh, for those folks that want to uh, go and pull this after this session. It's, they, they make some pretty interesting and actually some pretty scary predictions about um, uh, vulnerabilities and, and, and endpoint attacks. Uh, through uh, through, I think it's the next two or three years they actually make predictions on. So yeah, the takeaway is mobile attacks are uh, increasing. Obviously, if you're an enterprise, one uh, one successful attack could represent uh, huge amounts of uh, damage to your enterprise, uh, both in terms of um, lost proprietary information, but also in terms of potential in terms of reputational damage. Uh, and, um, and, 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 and quite a few other issues. So it's really vitally important that uh, enterprise users are securing um, Wi-Fi for their mobile users as they're traveling around outside the enterprise with enterprise devices that may contain uh, sensitive uh, sensitive company information. Um, so you, you, this uh, this data point, I think, is a little bit low, actually. The, the, the data that I'm seeing uh, indicates that... Um, uh, you know, in certain parts of the world, we're seeing probably 75 to 80 percent of mobile data is actually going to be shipped over Wi-Fi, and that's especially going to be the case as people are using more and more, uh, you know, uh, high bandwidth collaboration tools, um, where the cellular network just won't give them the throughput on the latency that they actually need to hold uh, online web meetings and, um, and collaboration sessions. So certainly, in in in, in uh, in some verticals, uh, some and some enterprises in some parts of the world, we're seeing this. Uh, we're seeing this data a little bit higher. Um, so, uh, you know, Wi-Fi mobile devices are generating generate 78% of internet traffic by 20, uh, 2020. That speaks to the whole fact that people are kind of moving out of enterprises and are going to be increasingly mobile. Uh, and it looks like we're going to have about 11.6 billion uh, mobile connected devices by 2020. Um, the number of different attack vectors. Are uh, the uh, sorry the slide isn't quite building properly. The the attack vectors for uh, people that are using public Wi-Fi are, 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 are many and varied. Um, you know there are still issues around uh, uh, insecure authentication, uh, open radio bearers that aren't being encrypted, i.e., completely open open hotspots with no passwords. Um, there are issues around unprotected backhaul. Uh, you know, you may have a very secure authentication scheme to log into a public Wi-Fi uh, system and a nice-looking portal and all that stuff, but if the backhaul away from the from the controllers and the access points isn't isn't properly secured, then those the, then your data is just as valid, uh, just as vulnerable in transit as it is on the radio side of the connection. Um, also, we're seeing uh, an increasingly sophisticated um, AP spoofing attacks. And um, these are uh, really kind of manif being driven by people that want to uh, really maliciously go after uh, enterprise assets, and they're, um, you know, they're, they're, they range from 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 simple attack vectors where people are sniffing for passwords and, and credentials to then subsequently go and log back into sites. So really sophisticated attacks uh, around man-in-the-middle attacks, 
uh, and, and being able to, 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 to spoof and replicate popular websites and actually steal uh, information that people may be pushing to, um, uh, pushing to uh, uh, online uh, cloud storage platforms, as well as as well as grabbing uh, as well as grabbing user 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 credentials. So this the, the the kind of old way of doing things around grabbing user credentials and then going back and accessing data is actually being supplanted now by kind of application layer attacks. Uh, we're starting to see some very very sophisticated uh, uh, application level attacks starting to show up out there now, um, and also um, denial of service attacks. Uh, by virtue of people doing injection attacks into um, uh, into flows on public Wi-Fi and injecting malware onto users' device and then using that malware to do denial of service attacks, uh, we've seen a couple of instances of that um, starting to appear. It's gone a little bit quieter on that in, in, in that regard over the past uh, past few months, but we have seen a couple of cases of people using injection attacks on Wi-Fi to inject malware onto onto users' devices, completely, completely on a, with the user being completely unaware that that was actually going on. So lots of issues related to mobile users, lots of issues related to those mobile users accessing public Wi-Fi. Um, you know, banning public Wi-Fi really doesn't work for, for enterprise users. Um, they will always, uh, users will always tend to gravi gravitate either uh, consciously or unconsciously to public Wi-Fi. Sometimes they just kind of can't help it because their device just glomps onto the glomps onto a local Wi-Fi network that may be open. Uh, and, uh, you know, depending on the OS the OS type, um, some devices can be um, extremely aggressive at connecting to to, to free and open Wi-Fi. Um, also, you know, they may have concerns around uh, international roaming charges still. Um, and the net is that the the while organisations uh, and, and we're we're quoting a stat down here about 50% of, of UK organizations are, are trying to ban their employees from using public and, and, and open Wi-Fi. It, it, it really doesn't work because users are just going to kind of sometimes unconsciously connect to these open Wi-Fi networks. And if they can get in, they get in and life goes on and they're not, you know, sometimes they're not necessarily that concerned about um, uh, or, or understand the issues related to accessing uh, potentially insecure public Wi-Fi networks. Um, so, you know, end user education is possible. You can either ban uh, access to public Wi-Fi, which really doesn't work because users are just going to use it anyway. Um, some, some level of end user education is possible, um, you know, educating users to be very careful about connecting to only, only sites with HTTPS, making sure that they don't accept uh, browser warnings that are warning them about, um, you know, change certificates or suspect certificates on these sites. Uh, we're seeing we're seeing attacks around uh, that specific use case where you know people are doing man in the middle attacks and are in injecting their own certs into into HTTPS dialogues and users will just tend to click on the will just tend to kind of click on all the browser warnings and go through them and and, and, and go to this bogus site um, uh, using this bogus using this bogus cert um, in, in increasingly it, it, it would appear. Um, Two-factor authentication is uh, is always a good thing to try and thwart some of these application level attacks. Um, not not by any means uh, not by any means foolproof. Uh, disabling file sharing on the user's devices that should be kind of a default because uh, obviously if you're trying to do an injection attack and you're trying to do a malware injection, then having open file sharing on the user's device uh, is not a particularly good idea. Um, in terms of the future, you know the future is looking a bit brighter because uh, you know Aotoe One X and Hotspot 2.0 um, at least from securing the the radio bearer and uh, improving <coughs> improving the security of the radio side of things uh, and guarding against rogue access points and making sure that um, AP certs are, are, are valid and are, 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 are correct for, for that access points access point is 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 is, is going to be the way forward and IPASS is also moving in that direction <coughs> the challenge is that most public uh, footprint is actually deployed on quite old devices and there isn't that much incentive for the providers to, to actually upgrade those devices or even update the firmware on those devices. So we're seeing quite low adoption of Hotspot 2.0 um, uh, implementations globally. Probably only about 5% of the, actually it's probably more like 7% now, of the global iPass footprint is, uh, is Hotspot 2.0 capable. So we still have a lot of um, public Wi-Fi out there that users can access, which which needs to be uh, which needs to be secured. Uh, and as I say, you know, sometimes 
sometimes you know banning public Wi-Fi and user education sometimes it doesn't work right sometimes you've got to protect uh, users from themselves uh, and this is this is where what we do at iPass really re really comes into its own. Um, you know, iPass is part of the service as part of accessing our 60 million um, uh, uh, hotspots that that we, that we have under management around the world. Also adds multiple layers of security and, and, and authentication on top of the existing infrastructure. So we're taking the infrastructure that may have varying levels of security uh, and varying levels of robustness. We're kind of leveling the playing field across the entire globe in terms of you know whichever one of these hotspots that you actually connect to. If you're using iPass, you can be guaranteed a certain level of uh, or a very high level of of of, of security and, and throughput and performance. And we'll talk about how we uh, how we validate that in, in a second. So um, as I said, yeah, we look at the we look at the our, our, our whole infrastructure, including all the uh, 60 million plus hotspots that we manage globally and our uh, back-end infrastructure and the infrastructure of our partners as a single attack surface because we, we understand that people could be trying to attack us um, in, in all different directions for, with, all different, with all different vectors. So we look at the entire, um, the entire service as a homogenous uh, clump of stuff that somebody might want to attack. And then we're looking at, we're constantly looking at, you know, how would you attack our network? If you wanted to attack our network, how would you do it? What would be the ingress points? What would be the attack vectors? And also looking at, you know, we're also constantly looking at industry research, and we're also looking in, and capturing and tracking uh, attacks that we actually, or thwarted attacks that we see coming into our network. And the idea is, as I say, that we're trying to secure the unsecure. So it doesn't matter what the provider, the the, uh, the, the Wi-Fi infrastructure is, is is offering in terms of security. We layer in uh, a whole pile of other stuff on top of that to uh, uh, to, um, to 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 bring the security level up to what we think is a is a is a level which is much more acceptable to uh, to enterprise customers. And we're continuously monitoring uh, and validating our approach, right? And we're make, we're not just sitting there. We're constantly looking for new attacks, uh, constantly uh, on on guard for. Um, uh, uh, new t new techniques and uh, and uh, keeping an eye on what the quite, we're keeping an eye on what the hacker community are doing and the idea is to try and stay uh, one step ahead of new and emerging uh, attack vectors and, and new threats uh, that people might be trying to bring to bear on, that, on our customers because we have we do have a lot of uh, very large kind of you know blue chip enterprise customers and that list is is going to be increasing over the next few quarters including you know major major companies in the kind of management consulting space. And, and, and clearly, because they're handling very sensitive uh, data for their clients, they have very, very rigid expectations around um, around the security of the service, and, and we endeavour to uh, to deliver uh, against the promises that we make there. So, how do we um, how do we actually secure the unsecure? Well, let's let's go through, and this isn't exa an exhaustive list, and we could spend hours and hours and hours talking about what we do. Um, but we'll just go through a few bits and pieces which are, which I think are relevant, and then we'll talk a little bit about the stuff that we're doing uh, in the near future to really uh, uh, add another layer layer of security onto the iPass service. Um, so step one, you know, we first off we've, we're validating hotspots. Okay, so um, it's actually quite hard to get a hotspot to be part of the iPass network. So um, you know, we gather we gather footprint two ways, organically and inorganically. The the uh, the inorganic expansion is by vendors that we work with, where we're buying into access for their for their footprint. So an example of that might be uh, might be Fawn um, uh, in Europe or, or or other providers that we that we have out there, um, or uh, Xfinity, Comcast in the US. Um, also, you know, AT and T, uh, Deutsche Telekom, T-Mobile, all those guys. We're buying a BT. We're all buying. We're all buying into. It, it, we're buying into that footprint to gain access to it. Um, but when they give us that footprint, we don't immediately just open it up to our users. Um, there's a there's a multi-step process that we'll go through, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, we also bring in footprint into the network um, organically. So we actually are constantly looking around for uh, hotspots that we can actually connect to. Uh, and, 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 and log into that maybe free and open hotspots uh, that we can bring into the um, uh, bring into the iPass footprint and make those available to our users, even though we may not have a direct relationship with the provider of that particular hotspot. Now, obviously, with those with those hotspots, it's really critical that we we add in uh, a lot of validation around how secure are those hotspots. Um, uh, and, and do they meet our uh, do they meet our criteria? So even even so the 
the the footprint that we bring in uh, both organically and inorganically has to get through quite a few over over quite a few hurdles before it's actually accepted into the IPAS network. Um, so we, we, uh, we, if we add new footprint in, um, our clients will not automatically connect to that footprint. They will check that footprint and they will try to validate the footprint and they will make sure that the BSSID and the SSID combination uh, is always the same every time a client sees that connection. Uh, we measure the location of that hotspot, make sure it doesn't move around. Um, we also do speed tests in the background over that hotspot to make sure that it's actually got acceptable throughput and performance. We also check the, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> that the MAC address of that hotspot is within um, within ranges that we know are, 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 are hotspots that are, are, are from vendors that will be providing that type of infrastructure. So we're excluding MAC addresses from obvious things like MiFi devices and, uh, and other things like that. Um, and it takes quite a while. It, it, it kind of varies depending on the type of hotspot and the type of infrastructure, but it can take uh, over between 90 and 500 uh, client visits uh, to that particular location with the client checking in the background, not actually connecting to that hotspot, but just kind of probing and checking and validating. Uh, it can take between 90 and 500 probes before we actually accept that piece of infrastructure into our network. Uh, and uh, as, a, as a valid hotspot that we're, we are going to attempt, just even to attempt to connect it. This is not even logging in and logging in securely. This is just validating that that hotspot um, doesn't fit the uh, profile of uh, a rogue hotspot. And, you know, a rogue hotspots, because quite often they're based on MiFi type devices. You know, they, they, they're here today and gone tomorrow. The BSSID and SSID might not match up because they may be spoofing another hotspot that's in the same area. Um, they, may be, they may be physically moving around because the user's moving around in a coffee shop. So we're, we, we're using a lot of techniques to spot rogue hotspots within our network. So we're really looking for hotspots that we know are staying in the same place always exhibit the same parameters um, and, and same performance. But only after a, 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 we've, we've tested that over a period of time do we actually whitelist those uh, hotspots and bring them into our footprint. Uh, if we detect stuff that we think is suspicious, that gets even, even, even stuff that we think worked okay uh, initially, we will, black, we will blacklist that hotspot and it will not make it into our footprint. So it will not appear as a location that you can connect to within the, within the IPASS client. So once you've got the uh, once you've got the IPAS uh, client up and you can see this new hotspot that we've validated is available to you, um, even when we're connecting into that hotspot, you know we're we're making sure every time we connect that the the, the gateway certificate is um, correctly formed <coughs> and it's correctly signed by the correct CA. You know this is this is kind of basic stuff, but you'd be you'd be you'd be surprised how um, how many people fail to do this doing rigorous, uh, rigorous uh, uh, search checking against, the, against the, uh, the, the hotspot credentials to make sure that they're, they're absolutely valid. So step two in when you're connected to iPass hotspot is, is connecting, is, is, is checking the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the gateway certificate. And then we, uh, then we attempt to log into the iPass service to actually validate you against our platform. We use a couple of methods to secure that authentication request. The first thing is we do, um, we do, we have a, a pretty robust, a very robust encryption scheme to encrypt the uh, credentials as they are sent up to our platform. And those credentials are actually only sent once, um, the first time you actually use the service. Uh, subsequent to that, we actually use a one-time password mechanism where every time you access the service, we push a one-time password for, that's in use for the next time that you access the service. So it's very difficult to inject to 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 both sniff the credentials and then reuse the credentials because the credentials aren't that the original credentials aren't valid beyond the first time that you actually sign in. Um, the your valid credential once you've signed in is the one-time password which is issued from our platform. So it's very difficult to capture that. You have to be at exactly the right place at exactly the right time to capture that one-time password if you want to reuse it somewhere else. Um, and it's, it's, it has a relatively short-term validity, and it's not recycled, and it's regenerated every time you uh, every time you connect to iPads. Uh, and it's a beautiful thing because you, you actually, from a user perspective, they don't have to uh, uh, they don't have to uh, remember credentials or passwords or anything because that the little token is 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 stored on the user's machine. Uh, we'll talk about this a little bit later on. 
Um, we're very rigorous around what we do on the user's machine in terms of encryption as well. Oh, everything that everything that exists on the user's device is encrypted, uh, both data at rest and uh, and data that's kind of floating around um, in RAM um, is also is also fully encrypted because we don't want anybody kind of um, you know dumping out the contents of a machine and actually fishing around and figuring out how iPass authentication works. So everything. Uh, data in, data that's moving, data that's in RAM, and data that's at rest is all is all is all fully encrypted. Uh, and we're constantly looking at our clients to really understand, you know, if if you if, if you're really 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 serious about breaking into this thing and you had some pretty advanced tools, uh, how would you do it, and how can we uh, and, uh, and how can we stop people? Um, so once you've actually kind of logged into your iPass hotspot, um, and you, you know you're logged into a valid hotspot, you've signed in with your iPass credentials. Um, you, you know that's 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 you know a secure place to be, and, and, and the local physical connectivity is 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 validated, and you're not connected to a hotspot. Um, how do you secure the actual user data that's flowing across the iPass service? Um, well, we have a an integrated uh, VPN offer within the uh, well, service rather within the within the iPass client, um, and that can be invoked uh, at any time. It's actually uh, actually we made a slight change to. The way that this is implemented recently, it's actually defaulted to be on for all users for, for all iPass customers right now, um, and the the user can activate or deactivate uh, this last mile VPN, um, and, it, and it basically protects the user's data from you know, sniffing a man in the middle attacks, a modification, uh, and it, it, it prevents injection attacks from uh, you know in terms of people dropping getting into the data stream and dropping malware onto the user's device to do denial of service attacks. And it's all kind of part of the service. It's very easy to consume. Uh, effectively, what it does, it builds a secure VPN tunnel from the client machine uh, to um, uh, VPN gateways that we have in our data centers dotted around the world. Uh, and, and the user can activate or deactivate this as, as they see fit. We recommend that users, uh, users always use it because we always want to see their data protected from the, from the hotspot. Um, yeah, so there's an integrated VPN offer, which is free uh, for, for users to consume. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful thing. Um, for corporate users, we actually fully integrate into a number of different corporate VPN clients, including the ones that you can see below there, Juniper, Cisco, AnyConnect, Cisco IPsec, Nortel, NCP, and Checkpoint. Um, the, the, the way that this is implemented is, is really, it's actually really nice the way that we've done this. The, uh, if the VPN client supports it, and certainly the Cisco ones do, um, we can uh, the iPass client can actually bring up the VPN, the enterprise VPN client, and actually it can bring it up in a headless mode so that you don't actually see the client pop up on the on the, on the machine, be it Windows or, or a mobile device. And it can pass parameters into the VPN client and bring the VPN connection up into the enterprise uh, completely transparently with no with no user intervention. So for um, enterprise IT admin, that's a really powerful capability, right? Because if you think about a, a use case where a user is, you know, perhaps maybe in a web meeting or maybe sharing content or having a working session and could pick their laptop up and go outside the building and wind up, you know, in a coffee shop, connect to the, maybe even in the same session, connect to the, connect to the, uh, to the Wi-Fi in there. Um, all of a sudden, you know, we're not only securing the Wi-Fi connection, we're also bringing up the VPN back into the enterprise, so that they're not kind of, you know, they're not they're not dragging the session out into the into the public domain where it's uh, where it's where it's potentially uh, suddenly uh, suddenly vulnerable. Um, works really well. It's easy to configure from a portal uh, from our portal, so you can apply it to you know tens of thousands of users if you simultaneously if you need to. Uh, really, really, uh, really powerful capability for uh, for for any for any enterprise that's deploying VPN. So um, so there's no point in kind of securing the you know the the Wi-Fi side and the client side and the data side if your kind of back end is wide open and people can kind of. Uh, come in and, and, and compromise user credentials um, uh, in the back end. So we spend a lot of time uh, thinking about encryption, uh, both on the client side, but also on the platform side. So on our platform side, all data at rest is, uh, is encrypted. Uh, and from the data center point of view, we really follow um, some very rigorous best practices around security compliance. So uh, obviously all our data centers are SOC 2.0 compliant, that, that's table stakes. 
Um, we have also very strict information security policies around um, who's allowed to access uh, what data and what platforms. Um, part of the reason we have to do that is actually, um, you know, we have quite a few telcos and MNOs as customers, right? They have uh, uh, PII restrictions around, uh, you know, making user data available, which we have to respect because we see that PII data and they're, and they're our customer and we're, and we're handling that data. So, uh, and, and that's, you know, that goes way beyond the, the, the you know, protecting um, iPasses assets and iPasses users. That goes to, you know, protecting their regulatory uh, uh, licenses. So, you know, we, we, we take platform security and especially protection of PII uh, uh, very seriously because of the type of customers that we have. Um, Security. We, you know, we're constantly monitoring the platform using pen test tools uh, to 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 try and penetrate in through all the, the not that many, but the, you know, the, it's a complex platform, so we have a few different interfaces and APIs and ingress points, and we're constantly uh, pen testing against those. Um, and all code and platforms and systems before they go to production, and this includes the clients, are subject to. Uh, fuzz testing and threat model analysis and static code analysis, and we beat on that. We beat on the software um, like you wouldn't believe to make to make sure it's uh, it's secure and robust. And it can't be. It's not just it's it's secure, but it's robust. And that goes to the fuzz testing uh, uh, aspect. You, know, you can't kind of <coughs> you can't kind of overrun the software or get it confused or or or, or, or drive it into the ground or or, or 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 compromise it through DDoS attacks. We make we we we. We place a tremendous amount of story, making sure the platform is is both uh, extremely secure and extremely robust. So, um, what's coming up next? So, one of the things that we're implementing, um, and I can't go into a lot of detail about this because for obvious reasons, um, but we're looking to layer in on top of the, all the security stuff that we talked about earlier on about validating hotspots, about checking certs, about having secure. Uh, credentials moving around the network about encryption and, and, and uh, ruggedizing the platform. We're looking to go to another le level over the next few months. And what we're going to do here is, um, uh, is, is is really build some mechanisms into the service so that the the client that a user may be using, and that might be the user's client or it may be the um, uh, an SDK-based client that somebody may be taking our SDK and integrating it into their service. We're looking to build mechanisms into the platform to always make sure that that client is talking to iPaaS. Now you might think that that's kind of obvious because we're doing all those, you know, credential checks and and and, and, and cert checking earlier on, and we're you know we're checking with the platform about which hotspot is valid. Um, there is a there is a type of attack vector that, that we recognise. If you're a very very sophisticated hacker. You could potentially uh, you could potentially leverage. You need a lot of equipment, a lot of time to do it, but you could do it. Um, and we're looking to head off that attack by always making sure that the client is always talking to iPaaS, and, and not just at the beginning of the session, which is kind of what we tend to do when we're authenticating against the service, but continuously throughout the, the user session. We're making sure that the or we're building mechanisms to make sure that the client is always talking to the four different platforms that we're talking to there. So the authentication servers transaction servers, the VPN servers, and the Smart Connect servers are four platforms within our network that an iPaaS client is, is chatting away to all the time. We're looking to put um, some mechanisms in to always make sure that that client connection is always talking to iPaaS because one of the, one of the, uh, one of the possibilities is, that, as I say, you have to be very sophisticated to be able to do this, is that um, you could, in theory, spoof the entire iPaaS platform, including one or all of those server platforms if you're really sophisticated. Um, and you could do it post-authentication, in theory. It's very hard to do, but you could do it. Um, so we're building in another level of security to make sure that during the session that a user is actually having on the iPaaS network uh, or platform, um, that the user is always connected to, or the user can be certain of always being connected to the, um, to the iPaaS platform. Um, one of the things that we're actually noodling around doing as well, and, and this kind of goes a little bit against our ethos in terms of user design, uh, but it's something we're, we're kind of looking at, is, is having the notion of, of being able to inform the user that they're in a, um, that they're in a potentially bad neighborhood from a Wi-Fi perspective, right? That we've detected rogue hotspots in that area, and we've detected attacks. 
and we and we deflected this attack and we deflected that attack. It kind of goes against our UI uh, or user experience ethos because we we've always wanted to be, the client to be very quiet and invisible and just kind of sit there. So we're maybe thinking about delivering that to users in a different way. Maybe kind of a monthly email that comes out and says, "Hey, you know, um, <clears throat> you know what? When you were in this area, there were this there were these attacks. You know, these attempted attacks against your platform. And, you know, this is what happened, and this is how we deflected." Um, but we, 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 we're kind of investigating that right now. That might be something that shows up in the service a little bit later on in the year. What is going to happen very soon is this multi-level um, and, and, and temporal-based continuous connection validation. Um, uh, that's going to be built into the platform within the next quarter or so. And um, we're also moving away from a reliance on public certs and public CAs um, uh, and SSL. Because obviously, there's, there's, you know, it doesn't take long on Google fishing around out there to understand that there are known vulnerabilities around um, both public CAs uh, and how they dish out uh, uh, root certificates quite often or cert pairs. And obviously, there's some, there are some vulnerabilities to, uh, to uh, SSL, which some have been injected by certain governments, um, we believe. So we're, you know, we're looking to. Finding you know, is there is there a, is there a better way is there a better way than using public certs and SSL to to secure communication that's going on uh, across our platform? All right, so they're kind of some of the next steps uh, that we're looking at to add more and more layers of security onto the uh, onto the service. Um, so you know, just to just to remind you what IPASS is all about. So you know, we have about 60 million hotspots, over 60 million hotspots in 120 countries. We work with 160 different vendors to provide the infrastructure that we've been talking about for the past 30 minutes or so. Um, very simple to use service. Uh, it's a kind of one-time um, uh, subscription fee that's paid on a monthly basis per user. Um, the, the service in general has moved to a completely unlimited service um, so that you can consume any footprint anywhere. Uh, the latest pricing package and packaging that's coming out um, actually also includes unlimited in-flight. So very, very simple for, for enterprises and users to understand because it's basically one price for everything everywhere. And it includes all of this uh, uh, cool security stuff and it includes last mile VPN, which quite often is, is, is charged as a, as, a, as a separate standalone service. So, um, you know, so, so to summarize, IPASS takes you know, the security and privacy extremely seriously. We have to because of the partners that we've got, including large telcos, um, large OE, some of the larger OEM partners we work with, as well as a number of the blue chip customers that we, uh, that we have um, who are handling you know, potentially very sensitive uh, information for their clients. We, we, we live and die, basically, on the, on the security of our service. Um, you know, it's interesting. There's always been a debate around, you know, is 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 is, <clears throat> is, is on-prem more secure than SaaS? And I, and I would, I, I, I would contend, having been in the SaaS world for probably over ten years now, I'd contend that SaaS is probably more secure than most enterprise deployments because it has to be because they're running their business on it, and if it fails to be secure, they're, they're out of business. And we have very much the same ethos. You know, we we everything that we do. Uh, is focused on making the service um, as well as being easy to consume because uh, you don't want to place a lot, ton of impediments in, in the face of your users. Uh, we also we also seek to make the, the service as, uh, as secure as uh, as secure as humanly possible. Um, so uh, that's the end of the kind of formal slides that I had. Um, we it will take any questions that have come in through the uh, through the chat window. Uh, do you have any questions that have come in, Tom? Thank you, Neil. Um, no, we've not had any questions just yet, but we can stay on the line for a couple of minutes just to see if anybody wants to submit one. No problem. Uh, quite a bunch today. Um, yeah, so if you've got any, uh, any if, you, if you need any more information, we have, uh, uh, we have a white paper on our security implementation and, a, and at least a presentation on our security implementation. Uh, that's available. Just reach out to uh, to sales at ipass.com. I think there are actually two versions of that white paper. There's one um, there's one kind of high level marketing e one, uh, and then there's one that rec that goes into a bit more detail that that, that requires NDA for for, for obvious reasons. Uh, so you know, reach out to us if you uh, if you need to learn more about um, uh, how secure our service is, and also to understand a little bit more about um, 
iPaaS and the service itself and, and what it can do for your users. Uh, any any questions come in, Tom? No, we're still blank. So all right, I think well, we're good to go ahead and close. Uh, all you. right, well, great. Well, thanks very much, everybody. Thanks very much for your time. Uh, I think Tom will be sending out a follow-up um, email with the recording for this session and the, uh, the slides for you to digest. As I say, uh, please reach out to us, sales at ipass.com or your account manager if you're already an existing iPass user or a partner, um, and we'd be happy to answer your questions on uh, iPass security. Thanks very much, and have a great uh, rest of the day.